India, with its rich heritage and history spanning thousands of years, stands at the crossroads of tradition and modernity. India, the land of diversity and harmony, believes that the concept of Vasudev Kutumbakam holds the key to addressing the interconnected challenges of our world. It echoes the vision of a global community where all nations stand united as one family, bound together by shared values, aspirations and responsibilities. From time immemorial, India has been a torchbearer of peace and cooperation among nations. Our country's ancient civilization laid the foundation for the principles of coexistence and mutual respect, which remain at the heart of our foreign policy. India, being one of the world's largest economies and an influential player in international affairs, has been an active participant in the G20 summits. It has actively contributed to discussions on various global challenges and worked towards promoting inclusive and sustainable development. As India hosts the G20 summit this year, it is an opportunity for the country to showcase its economic progress, technological advancements, cultural heritage and diplomatic leadership on the global stage. The G20 summit will also present a chance for India to engage with other member countries, foster bilateral relations and shape collective efforts to address pressing global issues. With pure Indian values that say Aditi Devo Bhava, India is ready to welcome our guests for G20 and we are right here at the main venue convention center where this grand occasion will take place. Dhanda Singh and to talk about G20, we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal, Member of Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister of India. Welcome to the show, Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Mr. Sanyal, we're at the new convention centre complex, Bharat Mandapam, where India is going to be hosting the G20 summit. Can you tell our viewers a bit about the venue? Absolutely. So, this is the new look, uh, Pragati Maidan, or Bharat Mandapam. At the back, there are all these new buildings there, which uh, audience may not be able to see. But basically, this is the venue that will host the G20 Leadership Summit. So the G20, of course, happens over the course of the full year. But in September, uh, Prime Minister Modi is going to host some of the top leaders, not just from the G20, but for a bunch of guest countries as well. And this event is going to be held uh, right here in the building behind me. Uh, importantly, this where I'm standing is where the havan was done when this building was inaugurated just a month ago. And um, yes, so this is where it's all going to be. Yeah, this was inaugurated a few days ago and I believe you were a part of it. Could you please yes. share your experience? So I was here. Um, we had the event right inside. Um, big cultural event. The Prime Minister spoke very passionately. Uh, we had thousands of people. But the most important thing that really struck me is the sheer scale of this building. So those of you who have been to Pragati Maidan over the years, anybody from Delhi would definitely have visited it uh, during uh, some point in their life. Um, these were older buildings from the 1970s. Um, great for their time, but these have now been upgraded into these very modern 21st century buildings. So um, they look great from outside. And at night, if somebody can show a night shot, it's also very nice. But really, when you go inside, you realize how modern they are, latest technology, Fantastic acoustics, uh, world class. All right, now that we are going to be talking about G20s, India's G20s presidency, could you tell our viewers about what in G20 and what is the significance of G20? So G20 is a grouping of 19 countries plus the EU. So that makes it 20. Now, why does this group exist? This basically came into play uh, really starting in the 80s, what was found that the older institutions like the UN, etc., they were becoming unwieldy. So a smaller grouping called the G7 turned up, which was basically top economies of that time. But certainly by the late 90s, it was understood that these developed countries, the G7 was not a good enough grouping. So in 1999, a larger grouping of countries, which included the emerging countries as well, like India, Brazil, and many others, and this grouping came uh, together initially just as a financial grouping. So this is the finance ministers and the governors of the central bank that came together. But it was understood very quickly 
that a grouping of this kind was needed because this represents about 85% of world GDP, something like 70% of the world's population and so on. So a smaller grouping of these, 80 uh, of these 20 participants really provided a better and more maneuverable group for managing the global architecture, whether it's the financial sphere or many other issues. So whether it was the global financial crisis, which you will remember from 2007, 2008, Again, the G20 played a very important role in managing that. Then, of course, you had the COVID crisis more recently. Again, you remember many of the other organizations like WHO, uh, UN, etc. cetera. Uh, their response had, you know, a lot to be, wasn't up to yeah. speed, as you know. So, basically, it turned out to be that the G20 was the only organization that did keep the world running, in a sense. So the G20's global action plan and many of these... Uh, protocols they created basically kept the world going during those years. So the G20 has effectively become the most important international forum in the world today. Yeah. And this year, that's 2023, uh, we have India running the presidency. Great to know about what is G20 and what is the need for G20. Now coming to the next question, I'm sure our viewers would want to know, how does G20 function? So first thing is G20 does not have a permanent secretariat. So it doesn't have a bureaucracy that runs it. Every year, a country from the G20 pool becomes the presidency. And during that year, they become... So it's not a presidency as in they are the uh, people who are kind of... It's not a presidency as the president of a country. It's more like they are the host. And during that year, they host it, they run it. And this year, we are hosting it. Of course, it, by virtue of being the host, you also are able to um, provide and lead on various gro global issues... Uh, bring many issues that may be of interest to you to the to the platform. So it does have an advantage to be a, to be a, a presidency. And of course, um, what happens here is that there are two tracks that run under this. One is the finance track, which goes back to the original functioning of that, which just relates to finance ministries, uh, the uh, central banks, and uh, you know things like that. Uh, there, you, there's something under that called the Framework Working Group, of what, which I used to be the um, co-chair for five years myself. So I've been very much involved with G20. So that's the finance track. And then there is another track called the Sherpa track, which looks at other kinds of issues, uh, which relate to science or education, culture, uh, urban issues. So there are these two uh, groupings, these two tracks, and there are many working groups under them. Which, so that's how this G20 functions. All right, Mr. Sanyal, now how about going and having a look at the building inside? Let's go. All right, on the behalf of my viewers, my next question to you is, how has India's G20 presidency been so far? So, first let me explain to viewers where we are. This is the open amphitheater. This is where um, many of the cultural events will be held. And of course, uh, going into the future, many, many of you will visit it. So, um, this has been a fantastic year, the year 2023, because of course, this has been the first completely open year after COVID. So, in that sense, India was lucky to have got it and of course it's a it's a great year to show global leadership unlike most other previous presidencies india really did it differently so typically what happens is that these events happen in a few locations a few cities and then a few locations where a lot of events sort of pass through instead india did it totally differently so we went for 60 locations across the country so every state capital every major city hosted g20 event in addition to that we had 18000 visitors that have already come or will be coming soon. Um, and so we have really turned this into a Jan Andolan in a sense. You know, almost no other country would have uh, gone and sort of got everybody involved in G20 through this year of celebration. So in that sense, it's been a real uh, great uh, thing for G20. In a sense, we have really set new standards for G20 in terms of involving the entire population uh, in this. So in sheer scale, this has been great. Also, we have been able to do a few new things. First of all, I think in terms of, of global leadership, particularly bringing up the views of the global south, India has really brought in 
a new dimension to the conversation. There are a large number of areas where we have opened up new spaces. For example, Startup uh, 20, completely new working group that, uh, 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 that we have created in the Sherpa space. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, innovations that we have done. And of course, other than the G20 countries, the this year when the summit happens in a few weeks' time, you will also see a large number of um, uh, guest countries and their um, uh, uh, presidents or prime ministers uh, coming. So this will be a real event where India will be able to showcase its uh, global leadership. Okay, let's go and have a look at the actual venue inside. Come, let's go. Let's go. So this looks like the lounge where various uh, heads of state will probably come and congregate before they go into the main hall, I suppose. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it is. All right, talking about both the tracks, the Sherpa track and the financial track, could you please tell us about the differences, the main differences between both the tracks? So there is the finance track, as I mentioned. The finance track is really derived from the original purpose of G20, which, as I mentioned, uh, was about the finance ministers and the governors of the central banks. And it has within it various working groups for investment and uh, managing financial system. Uh, it has something called the framework working group, of which, as I mentioned, uh, I used to be the co-chair for five long years. And this group really looks at the financial macroeconomic governance uh, of the world. So this is a very important part of the, the structure. The other track is the Sherpa track. That looks at uh, issues which are not related directly to economic management, but maybe about science or urban issues, health, uh, and those kinds of issues. So they are somewhat, obviously they're related, but they are run in two separate uh, buckets. Like, what do you think is the significance of this room? So this is the room in which the actual G20 summit, leader summit will happen. So the table you see around us, where there are 40 seats around circle, this is for 20 of the G20 principles, of course, but also extra seats for the invitees uh, who are going to attend the leadership summit. And so this is the room where it will all happen. It's absolutely fab fascinating. It's got this wonderful modernist uh, chandelier, these beautiful uh, pits um, and so on. So it's it's a real, uh, real privilege to be able to come to this room. Terrific. As we bring this to close, what were the discussions uh, when it comes to the financial track this year? So in the finance track, we had an um, amazing number of discussions. So if you look at the uh, discussions, there are quite a number of issues in which we have been able to get consensus across the table. One of them is the need to reform the multilateral uh, organizations. Uh, this has been a pending issue for many years, but finally there is now a uh, document where a clearly laid out a uh, set of things that need to be done to reform the multilateral development agencies. Then there is another issue that we were arguing for, and I think there is growing consensus, probably uh, consensus around uh, uh, that has been achieved which is that we need a global system of regulating the uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, it cannot be done by every individual country on their own. Uh, so it's something that we have been arguing for a while that, look, let's not try to do it country by country. Let's have some sort of a global system of uh, dealing with cryptocurrencies. So again, something that has been uh, broadly accepted. Then we have been arguing again also for a while that we have this digital infrastructure that uh, that India stack, so to speak, whether it's payments uh, and so on. And we have done rather well in it. In fact, India is quite unique in that it considers its digital infrastructure as infrastructure for the public good, as opposed to private, uh, uh, privately owned uh, goods. So what we have argued, and this is getting now more and more traction, 
is that we need to begin to treat these digital uh, infrastructure as something that has to be managed for the public good. And again, this is a, something that is gaining more and more traction. There are a whole host of other issues about you know how to finance cities and so on. But basically, this is what the finance track has been up to this year. All right. Good to know about that. Now, can you tell us about the Sherpa track? Like, what are the areas in focus there? So, as far as the Sherpa track is concerned, there are a whole host of uh, segments. There's Science 20, there's Urban 20, there's Culture. There are a whole bunch of other issues. So, uh, very difficult to put them all together. But let me give you a flavor of some of the ones that I did attend myself. Let's take Urban 20, for example. In Urban 20, of course, there were many of the uh, things you would expect, for example, climate change and water security uh, and so on. But there are a couple of issues that we brought up which, you know, uh, were quite new. For instance, um, the importance of culture in a city, uh, a sense of place. So one of the things you will notice if you go to cities around the world is that they're increasingly beginning to look uh, the same, the same glass and chrome type buildings. So one of the issues that uh, were brought up in G20 is that we need to invest into giving a, a place a sense of personality because that's really what gets the citizens of that place a feeling of belonging, right? So this was a major issue that did pop up in the urban discussions. Uh, in the science discussions, of course, there's a lot of emphasis on collaboration across uh, different countries and institutions uh, and academies. Uh, but also, for example, we discussed things like um, holistic health, uh, unfortunately, what has happened, the area of health has got um, largely captured by a particular form of healthcare, uh, which, of course, has made great strides. But, you know, bringing in uh, more traditional systems, things like yoga uh, and indigenous systems of health and into the conversation, taking more um, mental health into the conversation. So I think that is another area that there's been some progress in the health space. And... We have seen in many other places, for example, one big thing that has been uh, promoted by India as part of the wider effort on food security is to bring millets into the conversation, something uh, that, you know, had, we have done in the country itself. But, you know, there are many interesting food grains and uh, foods around the world, uh, traditional ones, uh, particularly. Um, so, again, bringing them into the conversation is, uh, again, something that uh, the Sherpa track has done this year. So let's go to the auditorium now. All right, let's go. India, with its uh, rich heritage and cultural diversity, will be hosting the G20 Summit here. And this is the first time India will be hosting this. What's your take on it? So, as you can see, we have got a fantastic venue for doing this. And um, it's not only 21st century quality in terms of technology, all the technology that's here. But, of course, there's a lot of effort that has been put in to showcase India's um, rich culture in multiple ways. So, whether it's the paintings here that you can see, there are all the uh, sculptures of the yogic uh, uh, postures that you you may have seen when coming up the the stairs, and then there are um, these amazing new sculptures as well, which is like for example, there's the uh, conch, the shank, just outside the uh, gate, and there are a whole host of other th uh, sort of motifs here and there, the, you know the kinds of doors we have and so on that are there, and of course during the event itself there will be live shows of uh, dance and music and so on. So, I mean, there will be a, a big show of India, uh, show to, to showcase India's um, uh, heritage, uh, art and culture to the world. All right, that's going to be amazing and we're all looking forward to it, aren't we? Absolutely. So those are the yoga postures at the back and there's all this stuff here that you can see. It's pretty cool looking stuff actually. Yeah, it is. It is. And then those horses up there. Well, we've pretty much shown our viewers the whole venue. So my question to you is, what's going to happen to the infrastructure after the G20 summit? Very good question because we have built this massive infrastructure. So what happens to it after these two, three days of uh, the leaders summit that will happen here? Well, first of all, let me say that this is a valuable new addition to the urban ecosystem of the Delhi NCR area. So this building alone has uh, 24 meeting halls. Uh, this is the smaller of the auditorium. So there's this auditorium. There's another bigger auditorium that then opens out into a big um, multipurpose hall. So together, they can, that can seat as many as 7,500 or thereabouts people, which, by the way, 
is uh, bigger than what the Sydney Opera House can seat. That's 5,500. So this can seat over 7,000 people. And so that will make this uh, not only India's biggest exhibition com conference center, it will be among the top 10 in the world. And of course, this is not just the Bharat Mandapam building. There are all these facilities around it which have been upgraded and so on, where you can have these big exhibitions and trade fairs and so on. Um, there are, you can have the book, Delhi Book Fair. Uh, you can have uh, all the you know technology uh, fairs. Uh, and of course, as every Delhi, uh, Delhi I will remember, you have in November the the trade fair, uh, which I'm sure uh, many people will be looking forward to attending in this absolutely 21st century updated version of, uh, uh, of Pragati Maidan. Well, we're outside the venue now and doesn't it all look so stunning, Mr. Sanya? Like this is so, so, so stunning. This is absolutely fabulous. So, um, I'm sure that uh, this will be the venue of a really outstanding uh, G20 Leaders Summit. But as I said before, inside, uh, this is also a major contribution to Delhi's urban ecosystem. And um, people from around the country will be able to enjoy it when they visit uh, events, um, conventions and uh, exhibitions in this venue uh, from here on. So I look forward to coming back here again. I look forward to coming back here too. So on that note, thank you so much for your time and for your valuable insights, Mr. Sanyal. Well, that's all for now, but do stay tuned to Sunset TV. This is Dipika Dhanda signing off. Namaskar.